All right, and now we will move ahead to business associations, which is unit five, business organizations, rather. Business organizations, unit five, uh, within the 12th edition. Uh, if you have a different edition, uh, make sure that you go to the business um, organizations section. Chapter 30 is where we will begin. Um, sole proprietorships and franchises. They are paired together rather awkwardly, although perhaps appropriately um, in this case, because sole proprietorships and franchises are different from the other uh, types of business organizations because a sole proprietorship uh, doesn't have a uh, the formalities of the other business organizations. And a franchise is a different type of business arrangement, separate from the concept of business organizations in the forms of partnerships or limited liability companies or corporations, as we'll see in the subsequent chapters. So uh, in chapter 30, we start with the concept of sole proprietorships and franchises. And we'll begin with sole proprietorships. So at its root, any going concern business, whether it's online or brick and mortar or large or small, is going to begin, if you trace it to its roots, to an entrepreneur. And basically all an entrepreneur is is a person who organizes and deploys capital, right, uh, in the building of a commercial or other enterprise. It could be any enterprise. It could be a government enterprise. It could be, but here we're talking specifically about business entrepreneurs. And commerce begins with an entrepreneur, right? And one of the first big considerations that that entrepreneur has to face is what form that business should take. Why does it matter? Um, be, there are four vectors that govern this decision, all right? And if you were to take these four vectors and you were to track across all of these chapters, right, and just note the characteristics of each, you would begin to see the differences in the various forms. And those four subject areas are creation concerns. How e easy is this? Uh, business form to create, um, liability concerns, anything connected to uh, the obligations of the company and the potential for uh, uh, additional legal liability as a result of engaging in that business, taxes, how are taxes collected, how are they recorded, how do they record income, right, how is, uh, how will taxes impact the operation of this business and capital uh, capital raising and as you'll see um, those choices are intertwined together so the four categories again are creation liability taxes and capital creation liability taxes and capital all right so that's the the, the rather uh, extended introduction um, so we'll move straight away to the default option if one is engaging in a commercial enterprise for profit and you don't select another form uh, either through actions or agreement uh, then you have a sole proprietorship right if it, if it is more than one person that default op option becomes a partnership, but that is a, the, the next chapter that we'll discuss. In chapter 30, we're going to start with a sole, single-person entrepreneur who is engaging in a business. And let's suppose that this business is a crafts business. They sell crafts, right? And so the qualities of this business... Um, will 
impact her decision because one of the first decisions she has to make is what form will the business take? We'll discuss the qualities of the sole proprietorship and then figure out, you know, basically that will explain her, her decision to simply engage in a sole proprietorship. I'm sorry, I uh, neglected to mention a fifth vector that I want you guys to consider before I continue, right? So I said creation, liability, taxes, capital, right? To that, I would add control. <laughs> and we may add a, a couple of others as we see. Um, but those five, creation, liability, taxes, capital, and control, right? So what is a sole proprietorship? It's the default option. And what happens in a sole proprietorship is at the point that you begin engaging in whatever commercial activity that you engage in, by default, you are that business. You have a pre-existing obligation under the tax laws of the United States in particular to report income from wages, but not just wages, from all commercial activity, right? So engaging, since you, you are the business, legally right um, so with regard to ease of creation it's the simplest of all it's the d default option you may find yourself in sole proprietorship land not having intended to start a business maybe you were just you know i don't know uh, baking cookies for a bake sale right uh to raise money right for a school so you're not the commercial enterprise right but people love the uh, recipe so much they say oh they want to buy more from you and so You've got a business. Well, you've also got a sole proprietorship. So, uh, ease of creation, very easy, right? Uh, you simply begin to engage in business. Um, the that the biggest advantage um, in the sole proprietorship goes to the category of control. The absolute lord and master of that business, that sole proprietorship, is the sole proprietorship. They are the king of the castle. There are no other decision makers. Um, certainly there are advantages to this, uh, but depending on the complexity of the business, that may or may not be desirable, or many other factors that may or may not be desirable. Um, the uh, but that's the major advantage. With regard to taxes, um, we'd have to put this in the category of pass, or, uh, I'm sorry, of direct taxation. Direct taxation. So we're, we're going to talk about several different categories of uh, taxation. Um, in, for a sole proprietorship, the business is not separate from you the sole proprietorship or the sole proprietor right so because the business and the business person are the same you simply itemize your deductions on your appropriate income tax schedule right um, as they relate to your business and you deduct the expenses which are itemized and uh, and you pay the appropriate tax. Um, the other scheme that we will, other schemes that we'll look at are pass-through taxation, which involve um, a recognition of the corporate or I'm sorry of the partnership ent entity or the corporate entity that uses pass-through taxation, but taxation at the level of the individual. And I'll explain that a little more when we get to partnership. And there's also corporate taxation. And corporate taxation involves essentially double taxation. Um, why would anyone want to do that? Well, <laughs> there, there may be reasons as a business gets to a certain uh, level to maintain a corporate form uh, in, in particular. All right. So 
but we're that's just an aside to kind of give you a sense of why I'm talking about direct taxation. Direct taxation is what we're discussing now. So you have a business entity, and so all of that record keeping needs to basically relate to your personal income tax uh, filing. A, an important point to remember here is that just because one is a sole proprietorship, um, does not mean you, you need to still sort of follow all of the formalities with regard to taxation that relate to any commercial enterprise, right? Um, for example, you need to pay Social Security taxes on your, for your employees. Uh, you need to pay um, unemployment taxes um, because that's the the focus of the of the of case uh, 30.1, uh, Gadley Enterprises case. So the obligation, right, is as if you were a big corporation to still pay commercial taxes, right, is crucial because those are your personal obligations, right, uh, which is, uh, and why does that matter? <laughs> Why does it matter if I say that those that those uh, those taxes are your personal obligations? Because in the other categories of, of business organizations, right, among those include business organization forms where those taxes would not be your personal obligation, and those other liabilities would not be your personal obligation. But that's under the topic of liability. So far, we've learned that we have ultimate ease of creation, right? We have absolute control and we have direct taxation under sole proprietorships. The control aspect of the sole proprietorship makes it particularly attractive because it leads to Perhaps the most distinct advantage of the sole proprietorship is its nimbleness. It can be extremely flexible. It can turn direction on a dime. A dress shop can become a shoe shop overnight, uh, theoretically. I mean, if the market was really going in that direction. Uh, so that is a big plus to balance against some of the other features. And we begin with the biggest, um, I guess, you know, I, I was going to say negative, but it really is just a feature, right? Uh, someone has to be responsible for the biggest, I mean, for, for the liabilities of the company. And I don't mean in the sense of losing a lawsuit. I mean, just in general, the obligations of the company, someone's got to be responsible for it. And so... That person, if you are the sole proprietor, is you. And that means that your personal assets are at, at stake. All right. So let's say that you are the sole proprietor. And so let's take, um, uh, let's take our example from before. Jackie owns her uh, crafts enterprise. Right, it is a growing business. It does well. She sells candles. She sells home decor. She sells lighting fixtures, little things handcrafted. Right, so she does pretty well. She amasses a significant, small, uh, you know, business fortune. Right, so she's a sole proprietor. Her assets include her you know, personal assets, which she may have accumulated, uh, a few items if the business grows to, you know, let's say a few million dollars, right? And she has business assets. Those assets are the same thing, all right? Uh, the business is uh, Jackie, and so Jackie is the business. And so if a business turn goes extremely south, Jackie's risk is 100% of everything that she owns is at stake, 
alright? That's not necessarily true with some of the other forms of business organization, which we'll get to in the next chapter. But that's certainly true with respect to the sole proprietorship. The sole proprietorship is absolute liability. So under liability, you could use the phrase absolute, you know, you just need short notations here, absolute liability. So ease of control, e I'm sorry, absolute control, absolute creation, I'm sorry, ease of, ease of creation, absolute control, absolute liability, direct taxation. All right. Um, so one, um, another, or the, another of the disadvantages. Well, first, before I, I should address the 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 risk, the personal assets at risk. Um, how how do sole proprietors deal with that? All right, they deal with it in part the way that other businesses deal with it, right? They will obtain insurance policies that are meant to insure against certain eventualities, right? Um, that's not a perfect solution. You can't insure against every possible thing, and certainly not with a general business insurance policy, but it does provide some protection against certain potential losses. Um, another potential uh, uh, downside is uh, succession, which is a concern for all business organizations, right? Uh, but what happens to the business after Jackie dies or becomes incapacitated and unable to run the business, right? Um, assets basically waste if there is no I mean, it basically, you go out of business. Jackie is the business. If Jackie dies, the business goes away, but the assets are still there, right? What happens to Jackie's little craft factory, right? Um, what happens to Jackie's employees? Um, that is a concern that should probably be dealt with by using a will or some other type of uh, testamentary document um, or perhaps trusts, um, a trust document um, that could be used in coordination with a will that will, uh, obviously a will is a, is a document that is, if in proper form, binding and uh, a determinative of the disposition of the assets of a person after they die, all right? And a trust, uh, which can be a testamentary or a non-testamentary trust. A trust is a document that has, that is a, a legally recognized entity that can hold assets and which can provide direction for how those assets are to be used, right? So a sole proprietor, if your business grows to be of certain size, you got a certain number of stakeholders, right? And you still want to be a sole proprietor, which is, you know, you can have a significantly sized business as a sole proprietorship. Um, you can have, uh, for example, exterminator, extermination companies can be millions of dollars, right? It could be a sole proprietorship. It's entirely possible. So, you know, what happens, right? Well, if, you know, the let's... I like Jackie. Let's not kill her off. <laughs> let's let's have a new character without a name. The, the exterminator dies, right? He's got 12 employees. He's got four vans, right? Five vans or six vans. I don't know. Two, I don't know. Two, they got two at a time or whatever. He's got offices. He's got leases. He's got all of these things. Um, he can use a will to determine, let's say he's got an employee in mind to run it, he's got a, a, a beneficiary who will be the, you know, recipient of the owner of the business, right? Um, he's got some type of arrangement, instructions maybe included in the trust 
that tells the trustee. So a trustee is a fiduciary, basically a, an agent of the trust, um, to, uh, to oversee the administration of that business, right? Um, all sounds very complicated, but, and it could be, but the fact of the matter is that any corporation has got to have a succession plan. And just because you're a sole proprietor doesn't mean that um, you are uh, immune from, from that requirement unless you just want the business. Maybe it's a business that's so simple that it can simply close down, right? Um, it does mean, however, that your heirs probably leave some value on the table. I'll tell you a story. It came to me from a, uh, some business brokers I knew um, that I was uh, talking some business with. And husband and wife team, neither here nor there. But the, the point is, uh, they were saying that there was a, a gentleman they were trying to, I guess, trying to figure out what to do with his assets. He passed away, right? Um, they were trying to sell his assets as if um, they were a business. I'll tell you about the business. The business was a, a an athletic wear company that made paraphernalia um, relating to uh, teams at historically black colleges, right? And so the assets at that point were lots of boxes of you know paraphernalia that could theoretically be sold, right? Um, however, this guy had guess done this for some time, years I guess, and what were not included in those assets were the contracts that allowed him to uh, to to make those sales. He didn't provide a merchant's um, a way a way for a subsequent merchant to continue that business without him and it would have probably been fairly simple to do so with some contracting language it may have required third party approval but the succession plan now what does that mean it meant that instead of having uh, mm -hmm. a business after he died that his heirs could then sell as a going concern because it includes licenses, right? That he'd already gone through the power, of all of, all of the work of obtaining, right? Uh, and, and and instead, they sell something much less valuable, which is you know a few thousand dollars worth of of athletic equipment. I mean, I'm athletic wear. Um, it, it is a very different transaction, and just because there wasn't planning, and that is a Lack of continuity is a significant issue, right? Um, the, uh, the, another one, another negative, or not negative, but it's, uh, you're limited in capital. All right, so we've gone through, we know there's absolute control, there's ease of creation, there is absolute liability, there's direct taxation, and there's capital. So this last, uh, downer <laughs> is that a sole proprietor is limited to their personal resources or the resources of those whom they're able to raise money from. Uh, so this means that bank uh, loans, personal bank loans, right, or loans secured against your assets, again, another layer of personal liability. Um, or loans from family and friends or their banks or, you know, for their loans, them taking out loans on your behalf. It's all types of, there are ways for sole proprietors to stack um, uh, financing, but it is definitely pretty close to bootstrap financing, which is a term that we use to describe uh, uh, running an enterprise with non-traditional <laughs> uh, financing methods combined with perhaps some financing from from traditional resources so the this is a significant limitation all right um, how is it significant as compared to the next business organization well just take the partnership 
all right? Um, no one is more invested in a business than its partners, right? Uh, the, uh, take on just one, if Jackie takes on one partner, Jackie takes on Joe as a partner, right? She's no longer a sole proprietor. All of her resources, all of his resources now back that business, right? And then together they can network and find other people because Joe knows as many people as Jackie does. And so in their quest to find financing, they've got twice the brain power, right? Um, now, obviously there are other forms that are even more advantageous as compared to sole proprietorships with regard to um, the, the raising of capital, right? Uh, but again, that is a limitation, but there are lots of opportunities that sole proprietors have taken advantage of. Um, and the modern age has brought such technological um, uh, 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 ease. It's democratized in some ways access to small amounts of capital, right? Um, I've, I've Obviously, I've mentioned that I'm I am a, uh, a cartoonist, uh, an artist, and a, and a writer, and I've, I've watched the, some of the creators of uh, content uh, raise money through uh, organizations like Kickstarter to help fund their business. And they simply provide premiums or you know, other in inducements to pe for, uh, for people to come and invest small amounts of money in their businesses and it ends up raising significant amounts of capital. Um, it's possible to do that as a sole proprietor. One has to be creative, right? Uh, one has to be creative at all levels with all of these business organizations, right? Just filing for a corporation doesn't simply, it's not simply, it's not important to simply run out there and file for any type of business organization. You can always start the ideation and the early implementation of any business as a sole proprietor, right? Just about. Um, if you're doing it from the ground up, right? Um, but the, the limitations on capital raising are, you know, not insignificant. And now, ladies and gentlemen, put aside for a bit the chart that I know you're now creating that is composed of the vectors creation, liability, taxes, capital, and control. Set that to the side, all right? We're going to go in a totally different direction for the next few minutes. We're going to talk about franchises. And franchises are a cre creature of intellectual property law. If you will recall, intellectual property are the legal protections provided to the products of the mind, and these include trademarks, copyrights, patents for processes, all types of things that businesses use in order to uh, protect the ways in which they make money, all right? And so a franchise arrangement is a licensing agreement where one party licenses from the other party the right to use the intellectual property of another, among other things that franchise agreements cover. But that is the thing that makes it a franchise. It's essentially an intellectual property exchange and use agreement or a license. Franchises are virtually, in all cases, legally independent not in all cases. I'm going to give an exception in a minute. So, but they're legally independent of the the two parties are legally independent of one another. They are in a contractual relationship, right? The franchisor is the party who is allowing their intellectual property to be used. The franchisee is the party who is purchasing the right to use that intellectual property and business, including business processes, their trademark, any copyright material, etc., etc. They're legally independent entities, but the, 
they are the franchisee is economically dependent on the use of the franchisor's technology, trademarks, everything. All right. So it is important to consider the nature of the franchisor if one is the franchisee. If one is the franchisor, you are in the driver's seat. You can there's a whole lot that you can dictate. It's a they're very interesting stories about the, the the various types of experiences that business people have when they enter into a franchise uh, or when they you know when they run a franchise and it is a very lucrative experience for some um, and uh, many actually um, and there are some things that people like about franchises and there are some things that business people don't like about franchises. Uh, if one is coming from the perspective of the franchisee, which we will uh, very shortly. Chapter 30 discusses many different uh, arrangements that fall under the category of franchises. Franchises are so common uh, many 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 uh, small business persons are franchisees right it's very common throughout many industries not just the ones that are listed prominently in the book like McDonald's or 7-Eleven or Holiday Inn there are just so many uh, many different franchises they form a significant portion of the uh, our economic activity in this country, obviously McDonald's alone, <laughs> right, is is significant. But there are so many different uh, outlets uh, because of the delivery of a consistent and, in many cases, nationally marketed system, right, that consistently attracts customers. As that, as that, if the if the marketing end of the franchisor's responsibilities are met, that that franchisees like the security of dealing within a franchise system. So it's very attractive for that reason, and it falls into different types. So take, for example, a distributorship. A distributorship is the right for a franchisee to purchase and sell uh, the uh, products of another, uh, of the main company, right? So you think of various automobile distributorships, right? Uh, automo where you buy your car retail is not 